Yeah, I gotta get Jer- to my Jer- Jerry f- retired for the seventeenth time in three years. Uh is going to teach us about meridian conversions. And hopefully by the time we're done, we're gonna know whether we gotta add or subtract it to a bearing. How's that? Uh, yeah, that, that'll that'll work. That'll work. Am I muted again or not? No, you're good to go now. All right, so I'm going to share my screen here and see if I can. You make me laugh every time you do your presentation. So. Do this correctly. Well, uh, he did. He did have an assignment. I don't know if anybody did it, but we'll be going through those as we go through the presentation today. So let it. me share my screen and let me put up this guy. <laughs> Share. You, are you, see my power, you see my PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Good to go. All right. Now let's see. That's where's my rest of my stuff. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I, this this came up because we were talking about in the Wisdom Wednesdays presentation. Yep. We're we're talking about rules of construction, all this kind of stuff, and the, and the issue of directions came up, and where they fall in the rules of construction and that. And the fact that uh, when you talk about direct, when you talk about a distance, we pretty much would know what you're talking about. Horizontal distance, ground distance, that type of thing. Everybody knows what you're talking about. But when you talk about direction, what kind of direction do you mean? Because there's all sorts of different references for directions. So when I decided to do a little presentation on meridian conversion, I always did this with students because this confused the hell out of students, particularly when you deal with magnetic conversions. But it goes beyond just magnetic bearings, because anytime you have to convert from one meridian to another one, you're dealing with a conversion. So um, let me go through just a couple of basic definitions. A, a meridian is a north-south reference line. Okay, it's just which which day which direction are we using as a reference for north? And there are a lot of there are a lot of different meridians that we use in surveying and mapping. Um, there's a true meridian, there's a geodetic meridian, there's a magnetic meridian, there's astronomic meridian, uh, and then I've got grid, 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 because there's a lot of different grid systems that we use. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the old surveyor's favorite, the assumed meridian. Uh, one One of the questions I always ask my students when I start talking about this in class was we're all sitting inside of a room inside of a large lecture hall, and I ask, I say, well, which way is north? Everybody point north. And of course, being being the first time they're in a mapping or a surveying class, they're pointing all over the place. So by the end of the semester, I had them all pointing in the same general direction. But one time when I was doing a presentation on legal principles for a bunch of lawyers, I asked the same question. I said, when we start talking about directions, mm-hmm. I said, which way is north? Point north. Over half the group pointed straight up. You know, like this. And and at first it threw me for a loop. But then I thought, you got to think in terms of context. When, mm-hmm. I'm, when I talk to a surveyor talking about a meridian, when you're talking to, uh, to somebody else that's not a mapper, when they're looking at a map, which way is north when they look at that map? It's up. So <laughs> when, they, so when they pointed up towards the ceiling, they were pointing in the direction that north is on a piece of paper. So it's kind of interesting. But anyway, uh, at the bottom there, I also have a couple of different statements relating the behavior of some meridians. Some blank, others blank. Some converge, others are uh, uh, others are parallel. Some are straight, others vary. Some are constant, some change over time. And there's different combinations of those depending on which meridian we're re- referencing to. So a meridian conversion is simply taking the direction of a line from one reference meridian to another reference meridian, going between the two, and and try not to introduce any error or uh, appreciable error in the process of doing that. So when we talk about the applications of of meridian conversion, uh, we've got the traditional, we're dealing between magnetic and true. And because we talk about early surveying, it was done all with a compass. And those were all based on the magnetic meridian and the early surveys of the public land survey system. You're supposed to reference the true bearing. So you had to have, or the true meridian, you had to have to know what the declination was. Da, da, and the solar uh, compass came along that, that solved the astronomic triangle mechanically and all. But, but basically, 
we have, we did everything based with the compass to begin with. Well, we don't use compass anymore. At best, if you have a total station somewhere inside the case, there's a little cheap piece of plastic called the tubular compass. It's a little north seeking arrow that you can stick on the side of the instrument and you can center your instrument towards north, but it's not very accurate. It, it generally is one of the first things to get lost. <laughs> the other one that we get in the traditional sense is uh, traverse to traverse. We've got two traverses that we want to put into the same mapping system, but they're not on the same reference meridian for whatever reasons. How can we go from one to the other? Some of the contemporary ones that we deal with, and we deal with these a lot, is between grid and geodetic, uh, and between grid to grid. And I said we have a lot of different grid systems. Well, each grid system has its own reference meridian basis, and if we're going to convert a direction from one grid system to another grid system, we've got to know something about how those two systems are related with respect to each other. And, and you see these references all the time on maps. If you look at a, a USGS topo quad, the old uh, seven and a half minute topo quad, you see at the bottom, a set of north arrows, I'll show you stuff like this, magnetic north, true north at the center of the map. <coughs> on uh, any type of property survey, there'll be a north reference or a basis for that direction. And it'll either be based on a grid system or an assumed system based on a section line or chord line or whatever. But there's some way to distinguish what that basis is supposed to be. Now, we don't always have that with old descriptions, but we're supposed to have that with contemporary types of surveys. And on the old traditional public land survey systems, they were supposed to measure and record what the declination was uh, for that particular township plat, and then record that as part of the uh, the plat when it was when it was submitted for approval. All right. So now we got to look at how do we define these different norths because we use some of them interchangeably. And that's not technically true. So we're going to first look at the old traditional conversions between magnetic and true. So we got to define what true north is and what magnetic north is. And it's interesting because, because depending on where you go, you can go to the geodetic glossary. You can go to the BLM definition of terms. They have their own glossary. You can go to the manual of instructions of 2009 or 73, and you can go to the NSPS uh, definition. You can even go to Black's Law Dictionary, mm -hmm. and they'll give you a plethora of definitions for all these things, and they're not all necessarily consistent. But basically, the, the best way to look at these, or, or a safe way to define these, is say true north is based on the rotational axis of the Earth. Now, the rotational axis of the Earth isn't a really nice stable thing. It wobbles as we rotate. But for the most part, we've got an axis of rotation defined for the Earth. So the, the north meridian, the true north meridian, would be the great circle on the face of the Earth that contains the north and the south poles and the observer's location. Okay? And that's constant over time. It's the, the same Earth that we have, the same rotation in that. Uh, and, and true meridians converge. So they're relatively uniform, and they converge to the north pole and to the south pole. Piece of cake. Magnetic north, on the other hand, um, is based on Earth's magnetic fields. And those are constant, the magnetic north and magnetic south are constantly moving around. So if we've got a magnetic bearing from 1830, that doesn't mean that that's the same magnetic bearing today, because today's magnetic north isn't going to be located where it was in 1830. It's changed over time. So magnetic meridians, they do converge to the poles, but they're not uniform. There are all sorts of things that affect the magnetic fields, local variations. In northwestern Wisconsin and northeastern Minnesota, if you look at uh, the, the shifts between NAD 83 and NAD, NAD 27 and NAD 83, you'll see up in that area right down there, there's a big area that's got this, this big wart in it as far as the, 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 the changes in positions 
because of the taconite and the iron ore mines that are up there that screwed up everything. As a matter of fact, that's why Bert developed his solar compass was because when he got to northern Wisconsin, he couldn't trust his magnetic compass. So he had to come up with some other way to try to determine where the meridian was. And that's what led him to, to develop the um, the, the solar compass but anyway so there are all sorts of mag all sorts of local things anomalies that will affect us so the magnetic north goes all over the place um and that movement of those poles is not constant over time declination is the angle from true north to the magnetic north meridian at a point we refer to that as declination some people refer to that as variation on the old survey maps you'll see it as variation uh, when I went through pilot school many, many years ago, we referred to uh, declination as variation. But, but in general, declination is a general term of where magnetic north is with respect to true north. And it's from true north to magnetic north, because remember, true north is the one that's constant over time. Magnetic north is the one that's, that's moving back and forth. So in this example here, we've got one magnetic meridian that's three degrees, 15 minutes to the east of true north. The other magnetic meridian is two degrees, 45 minutes to the west of true north. <clears throat> now variation, excuse me, is how much magnetic north changes over time. And it's not constant. Now, while we can record past declinations and we can model them pretty well, it's not easy to predict future declination because we just don't know exactly what the pole is going to do. And I have, uh, this, is a, an, this is called an isogonic chart. Uh, this is a snapshot in time of what the declination is at a particular time period. The lines of equal declination are called isogonic lines. The line of zero declination, this heavier one here, is called the agonic line. Now, that changes over time. And I do have a link to a website here. Let me see if I can show that on my screen here. Is that appearing on the screen or do you see that? Nope, uh, there it is, now it is. There it is, okay. Yep. This is uh, uh, at NOAA, this is a historic magnetic declination site. You can go there and put in a year and see what the declination was. And you can see there's a slider at the bottom that are now guys set to 2023 right now. So there's the, there's the agonic line coming through and these are all isogonic lines. Uh, north is off the edge of this thing right here. But if I cl click on uh, the model historical path <laughs> of the poles, here's what the poles look like over time. That's that's how they varied in that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and observed pole locations, that's modeled. The observed pole locations, the actual measurements that they made for the poles where they were at any given time. But if you want to see what the difference is, if you zoom in on your area, I'm going to zoom in on Wisconsin here. Uh, and I'm going to change my year. I'm going to go back to 1900. 1900. And I can see over time what happened with that declination. Uh, so you see my my agonic line is now way over east of Minnesota or east of Michigan. Okay. So this is a pretty neat site that shows you what the behavior is of uh, the declination at any given time. But you can see that the magnetic north pole is up somewhere up in Canada. It's not up at, at the traditional north pole like we think up in Antarctica and that type of thing. It's going towards there. And that goes off the map here. But that gives you a pretty good idea of what happens over time. And you can see these are magnetic meridians. They're nowhere near parallel or converge. They're, they're nowhere near parallel in that type of thing. So uh, it, to try to predict what they're going to do in the future is, uh, is pretty difficult to do. Well, it's impossible to do. But basically, <clears throat> the thing, and this is, this is what trips everybody up all the time with respect to converting between magnetic and true directions is they move the wrong lines. There's a couple of things you gotta remember. True north does not move over time. That sucker is, that's solid, that, that's always the same. The line whose direction you're trying to determine does not move over time. 
I don't care what anybody says about, you know, well, my line has moved over four feet. That doesn't happen. The line on the ground stays where it is. The only thing that changes over time is the magnetic meridian. So when we're talking about the directions of a line, the true bearing of a line never changes. The true bearing of the line in 1830 is the same as the true bearing of the line today. True is that. But the magnetic bearing of the line in 1830 is not the same as what it is today. And that's what usually trips people up is because they'll draw a line on a piece of paper, say, that's my, my meridian, and then measure everything off of that and make magnetic and true the same meridian. And that throws them for a loop. So, for instance, how many of you did the homework assignments? <clears throat> Those of you that aren't showing, that haven't got your video turned on, I, I, I assume that you're all vigorously nodding your head or you have your arms up in the air and you're ready to yell out what the answers are. Well, my head is moving, but it's not nodding. Not, not nodding. It's sort of a sideways nod, right? <laughs> sideways <laughs> nod. I'll take that. Sideways <laughs> nod. Okay. So we'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. all yeah. right. So. Real simple problem. This and it's kind of ones that you got to kind of think of what's happening. And I always tell my students, draw a sketch. Uh, it, it, well, they're, they're, like, my corollary is that is draw a good sketch. I mean, just drawing a sketch isn't any good if it's not a very good sketch. But we got a magnetic bearing of a line in, in 1885 was recorded as north 58 degrees 45 minutes east. Okay. The declination then was five degrees, 20 minutes east. What is the true bearing of the line? And <laughs> this was not too complicated, but when they first start to think about it, they, they kind of think backwards. But I say, build it in pieces. What do we start with? Well, draw true north straight up and down on a piece of paper. That sucker's never changing. Okay. Now, the other thing that we know is the declination in 1885 was five degrees, 20 minutes to the east. Okay? So there's magnetic north. There's our magnetic north meridian. So now the magnetic bearing was north 80, 58, 45 east. So coming off the north end of that meridian is 58, 45 east. What's the true bearing? We add those two together to get the true bearing. Now, this is one of the disadvantages of bearings versus azimuths. Okay? An azimuth is a continuous angle measured from north in a clockwise direction all the way around. But a bearing is measured either clockwise or counterclockwise from the north or south end of the bearing uh, of the meridian to the east or to the west. So in this case here, to convert a magnetic direction to a true, true direction, I had to add that declination, right? But if I'm down here to convert a magnetic bearing to a true bearing, what do I gotta do with that declination? Be I mean, hint, because I let in with a but <laughs> into that one, <laughs> since I added in the first place, this one I might have to do what? I have to subtract. subtract. Because I, because my magnetic south is west of my mag my true south. Okay. Now with with an azimuth, it doesn't matter which quadrant you're in because you just add or subtract and bang, you're done. But with bearings, you got to be careful with that. Okay. Because in some cases you can add, some cases you can subtract depending on the quadrant that you're in. All right. One more. Uh, this was assignment number assignment problem number three. Uh, magnetic bearing, this was a little more complicated. This is what kind of throws people for the magnetic bearing of a line PQ in 1925 was recorded south 8635 west. The present true bearing of the line is south 7950 west. What was the declination in 1925? Have any takers on this one? I can give you a couple of seconds to drop a sketch real quick on the scratch paper in front of you there. Remember, start with the true north-south line. <laughs> Anybody want to venture a guess on this one? Uh, 645 east. 645 east. Okay. Anybody else want to venture a guess? Usually what we do is we get a variety of guesses, and then we just take an average of them all. 
<laughs> so we do statistical analysis. We look for mean mode and all that kind of stuff. Medium, mean mode. Anybody else want to have an answer? I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just asking if anybody else has come up with something different. I concur with. I concur with 645. I'm just not going to say east or west. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other, you got a 50-50 chance of guessing it right. And, and I'll tell you what, on the exam, you can be sure that both of them are going to be there. Exactly. <laughs> Places. Exactly. As well as the obvious other math mistake one could make doing this. So, <laughs> yeah. Those of us that write questions like that, we're nasty that way. <laughs> All right, well, let's look at we'll get magnetic bearing of a line in 1925 was recorded as south uh, 8635 was well, present true bearing of the line to south 7950 was. So let's start with something that we can reference to a meridian, and that's the true bearing of the line, right? So if we start with the true bearing of the line as south 7950 west, right? Now the magnetic bearing was in 1865 and 1925 was south 8635 west. And this is where students then take and they'll draw 8635 off of this guy, but you don't. The line stays the same. What you got to do is you got to go backwards from that line to the south end of the meridian. So you have to go to the east 86 degrees 35 minutes from that 8635. Okay, that makes it southwest, which puts magnetic north on this side. So if you subtract true from magnetic, that gives you your 645, but which side is the declination on? Remember, it's that, that's at the north end of the meridian. On the south end of the meridian, it's east of it, but declination is always with respect to the north end of the meridian. A real easy mistake to make. That. So when you're converting that, if you're using that as your conversion factor for other for other directions, you, you've got them all rotated slightly in the wrong direction because you've gone to the west versus the east or vice versa. Okay, that is a great question because that was that would be on every pretty much every exam, <laughs> especially lately. Even well, but and that's and that's the type of question that we're dealing with. You know, that you might not take because yeah. How often, when you see a, a, a description that's got magnetic bearings in it, do they tell you what the declination was? Right. Never, hardly ever. Yeah. But you can recreate that situation if you know something about the true bearing today. Okay, you can, and then you can figure out what the declination was back then, and then that helps you recreate some of the other lines of the survey. Or figure out where to start looking for where the monuments are that are called for that have got bearings to them, you know, that you might have missed. If, if I'd have gone for six degrees, 45 minutes the other way, that would have put me over 13 minutes off on my directions, and I would have never found any monuments at those direction calls. Because okay, I'm looking in the wrong spot. So being able to convert back and forth between those is important from that from that viewpoint. And the difference uh, between that magnetic and the true, obviously, as well. Reading the question, yeah. right? When yeah. To that. So, <clears throat> great question. Yeah. So this one here, I'm just going to go I'll go through real quick. I don't know if I even worked this one all the way through. I may have just put one sketch up for this guy here. Uh, magnetic bearing of line ST in 1963 was recorded as north uh, 3855 west. Present magnetic bearing of the line is north 3850 west and a declination is three degrees 20 minutes west. Okay. So we got today's magnetic bearing and declination. We have 1963's magnetic bearing. The question is, what's the true bearing of the line? Well, how are we going to get the true bearing of the line? The true bearing is the difference between what and what. Well, we have today's we have today's magnetic bearing, right? And we have today's declination. So we should be able to go using those two pieces of information and recreate where true north is, okay, or what the true bearing is. And because we have where true north is, and then we know what the bearing was, magnetic bearing was in 1963, we should be able to recreate the declination in 1963. 
there's my sketch <laughs> mm-hmm. i didn't do that one in steps i just threw that one all up there at once but basically we started with uh the night uh, the today's uh today's uh uh bearing that we have a magnetic bearing and a declination that we have today and the bearing today and we can recreate the true bearing by adding those two together. Then if we subtract those from the magnetic bearing that existed in 1963, that gives us a declination in 1963. It all get, goes down to being able to visualize it with a sketch and remembering what changes. The only thing that changes over time is the magnetic meridian, the line is it's it's there it's physically it's physically fit on it you can't move that on the ground and true north is is fit. you can't move that either all right i'm gonna skip over this one this is a little bit more complicated i'll leave you to kind of play with this thing wrong this basically goes through uh going for uh, figuring out the relationship at one point for one line and then carrying that over to the next line so like if you're doing uh successive lines on a meets and bounds description how can you carry the declination from one line into the next line? I got the answers there, but I'm going to skip over them. Mm-hmm. The, other, the other type of contemporary problem we have, we do this uh, maybe not as much as we used to now that we've got GPS and stuff coming along. But one of the first problems we ran into when we started working with GIS, and this threw a lot of people for a loop, was when they tried to map adjacent surveys next to each other, they found out there were gaps and overlaps between them. But but a lot of times those gaps and overlaps didn't exist because it was actual overlap between the properties or a gap between the properties. It's because they were on a different reference system, directional reference system. So they, they were rotated with respect to each other. And it was a real common type of situation. Uh, if you had one surveyor that says, well, I'm going to assume this corner is 10,000, 10,000, and that way is north. And base everything on that because on a project-based system that's fine if all the uh a client wants to know is what's the area of my property or where are my where are my building setback lines you don't need a formal system but if you're going to tie it to other surveys you need to put it into some sort of reference formal reference system or into a common type of reference system so that's where you get all these different disparate project systems that had to be kind of brought in together. So we look at an example of, <laughs> say, two adjacent surveys. Uh, surveyor uh, Jones surveyed lot number three, assumed the direction of one line, AB. Assume that as north, because it looks like it about, runs about north. And he, and he did his survey and did all those adjustments and stuff and came up with these bearings all the way around the property based on the adjusted survey. Fine and dandy. A little bit later, Surveyor Black come along and surveyed lot number two next door. And she assumed one of the directions of her line, KL here, as north 50 degrees west. It looked like it ran about in that direction. And did the same thing, ran their, their survey and, and adjusted it. And these are all the bearings that came out of that adjustment. So on, on a project by project basis, these are fine. You're, you've got consistent directions. Everything matches. Everybody's happy. Okay. Now, what happens is if we want to put these next to each other, and if you've ever done this in a GIS system or whatever, or, or even a, in a mapping program, you put together two surveys and you do a zoom extents, and instead of seeing a really nice map of two parcels next to each other, you go way the hell out and you see these two little teeny tiny dots, okay? And they're because they're nowhere near on the same system and that type of thing. So you got to kind of resolve that. So that's what we're doing here. And it turns out, that line ED for Jones and line LM for Black, those are the common line between the two parcels. But you can see that we've got different bearings on those two guys. If we put them next to each other <laughs> and we try to map, we're going to get this type of thing happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick one end of that common line and rotate one of the surveys into the other one. It's sort of like a coordinate transformation problem, except we're not doing any scaling or translation. All we're doing is the rotation part. So what we got to do is we got to figure out, in order to do that, we have to know the direction of a common line in both systems. Well, we have that here. We have a direction of this line in this system. We have a direction of this line in this system. And they're both the same thing. 
So if I'm going to rotate uh, Jones survey into black survey, so I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to rotate this guy clockwise or counterclockwise, excuse me. And I'm going to rotate the difference between these two bearings, between the absolute values of the numbers, okay? Because the, the quadrant may be different depending on the direction that they surveyed around there. So I'm going to make that the common point. And I'm going to have to rotate uh, counterclockwise, rotate Jones's into there. And that angle that I'm going to rotate is going to be 17 degrees, 36 minutes, 23 seconds. Now, Again, we're dealing with bearings here. So that doesn't mean every bearing is going to increase by 17 degrees, 36 minutes, 23 seconds. Some of them will increase by that amount. Others will decrease by that amount, depending on which quadrant they're in. Again, that's an advantage of working with azimuths because all the azimuths would change the same amount. Okay? So in this case here, some of them get bigger numerically, some of them get smaller numerically. Now, what would have happened if instead of using this as a pivot point, I use this as a pivot point? Okay, I said, well, point, uh, uh, what is that? Point M and point uh, uh, D, F, D, I guess is, yeah. Those are the same point. What if I instead use that as a pivot point? What would that change? Rotation. Audience parts, boards, art parts. What would that change as far as the final bearings are concerned? Okay, these are the bearings I got. Oops. Ding, 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 ding. Those, these are the bearings I got by rotating it about point, this point here. If I rotate about this point here, what would happen to these bearings? The final bearings. They would be a 50-50 chance here. <laughs> the same uh, or different. Yep. 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 I, 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 uh, yep but but in between, in between, I need what what must be up. <laughs> They'll be the same or different. They they would all be different different by a, oh. a certain uh, uh, factor. Right. That's exactly 100% wrong. Oh. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter which point you rotate them about. You're still rotating Jones's <laughs> counterclockwise into black survey. You still have to rotate it counterclockwise. See whether you're rotating around this point or rotating it around this point. Now, what would be different, mm -hmm. however, is if we were doing a full coordinate transformation, we had coordinates on stuff, then yeah, the coordinates would be different. But as far as the bearings are concerned, and again, this is if I'm trying to resolve two old surveys that are next to each other, as long as I've got a common line between them, it doesn't matter which end of that line I use, when I'm rotating one into the other, I will get the same end bearings regardless of the pivot point that I use. See that? You, you can prove it to yourself later on by doing it numerically if you'd like. <laughs> or 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 fire it up in your CAD system and draw it up and then pivot one around the other and you'll see you'll wind up the same bearings regardless of which way you go. Okay. Well, the difference in the bearings is going to be the between the two surveys is going to be the same regardless. That's right. That's right. And you got to rotate it in the same direction. So your end your end bearings are going to be the same regardless of which pivot point you use. Hey Jerry, I got a question. Yo. So I'm looking at these and I see that north assumed. So why would you not just keep that line as north assumed and pivot lot two clockwise away? I could. And how much would each of those bearings change by it? Well, that'd be that 17 degrees. Yeah, it'd be the 17 so degrees. It would be on lot two. Right. Yeah. But then the other question I would have is um would there be an op would there ever be a time when you would do a compromise between the two <laughs> uh, <laughs> meaning meaning well, well, uh, well you know, considering considering both considering both of these are assumed you're putting one assumed system into another assumed system and you're still winding up with the assumed result at the end you'd like to be able to rotate an assumed system into a known system right 
Right. So, so instead of like, like say, yeah, it, it might have been more convenient to select this one, Jones, who's got a north, and, and then turn it, rotate everything into that. But if I just said, well, Jones was an assumed system, but Blacks was based on the county coordinate system, so it's a grid system, then I would rotate Jones into Blacks to get it into that same formal coordinate system or state plane or whatever. Okay. All right, thank you. But, but as far but as far as the compromise between the two, like rotated meet each of them halfway, I mean, it, it's, it's America. Where's my flag? <laughs> I don't I don't have my flag here, but I do have some flag stickers. This is America. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> um, so but but yeah, you you can do most anything, but but there really should be rationale for it. <laughs> in, in this case, it might be. We um, maybe Black's done a number of surveys in that area, and now he's going to be doing another survey that abuts Jones on the other side, uh, and he wants to put everything in his system or her system that she used. So she just wants to get Jones's rotator into her systems for consistency's sake. Mm -hmm. Okay, as long as you know which one you're rotating, how much, and in which direction, but you got to have that common line that's known in both systems. Okay. And that's really, when you think about it, that's really no different than when you're doing a site calibration for GPS. Part of what you're establishing when you're converting, when you're rotating the GPS coordinate system into your project coordinate system is you're aligning it uh, with respect to direction. So you have to have a minimum amount of known horror. You have to have a minimum amount of known horizontal control to be able to put that orientation the same on the ground or take that satellite orientation and make it coincide with what's on the ground. See, so we can complicate the hell out of this. Of course we can do it. <laughs> but I leave that to my students to complicate things. All right. So that that that's that's magnetic and uh and uh true the traditional declination problems, and the traverse into the traverse. The other type of uh, meridian conversion stuff we do is with grid and geodetic conversions. Okay? And again, now we need to define what, what are these norths. We, we looked at what constitute a true north and what constitute a magnetic north. Now, what constitutes a, a grid north and a geodetic north? Now, a geodetic north is defined by the reference ellipsoid and its fit. Now, the old NAD 27, we used the Clark 1866 ellipsoid, and it was fit regionally to North America. So it wasn't a good global fit type of thing. So our geodetic north was, was really very regional with respect to North America. It didn't mean anything outside of that. But once we moved to 83 and, and subsequent realizations, we went to a different ellipsoid with a different fit. We tried to get as close to Earth mass center as possible to better model the geoid and the Earth. So basically, <clears throat> geodetic north is pretty much the same no matter where you go globally. Kind of, okay, but for the most part, it's a much better definition than we have with that 27. So basically, what, what we have uh, on the, the geoid is the uh, the north and the south poles of the of the ellipsoid, excuse me, not the geoid. That's basically where the, uh, the axis of the semi-minor axis of the ellipsoid of revolution. Okay. Then the observer's meridian, where we are on there, is uh, the third point. So a great ellipse that passes to our position and the north and the south ends of the semi-minor axis define geodetic north. And that is uniform, they're smooth, they converge to north. And one of the other things, we're gonna have to take this into account later on, we talk about gravity-based systems, but when we reference ourselves to the ellipsoid, we're not referencing ourselves to a direction of gravity. We're referencing ourselves with respect to the direction of the normal to the ellipsoid. That is a line perpendicular to the surface of the ellipsoid at our position. So when we talk about geodetic 
latitude. That's different than astronomic latitude, and it's different than uh, geocentric latitude. It's different than geographic latitude because of uh, the reference line that's used to measure that angle from the ecliptic. So the geodetic meridians converge, and they're nice and smooth. They go to both ends of the uh, semi-minor axis. The grid system, however, is based on whatever the projection is or what type of whatever grid system you're using. And we've got lots of them. Every state has got state plane coordinates defined. Whether you've got a single zone statewide or multiple individual zones that cover different parts of the state, you've got one that's based on either the Lambert conic projection or the transverse Mercator projection, cylinder projection, or up in the case of Alaska and the Panhandle area, they have an oblique Mercator projection, but basically it's just a, a cylinder turned at an angle. So the, the geometry of those two types of projections, the cylindric and the, and the conic one, are slightly different, and they're based on the, the, the configuration of the area that the, that the uh, projection is fit to. But it's a function of that area, the projection, and how it's fit with respect to the ellipsoid. So generally what happens when, when a, a coordinate system is developed for an area, a central area is picked to fit that ellipsoid, to fit that projection too to the ellipsoid. And then there, there's a balancing of scales greater than one and less than one to kind of maintain them all within a range. And in the state plane coordinates, it's one in 10,000 for the old systems. And for the UTM systems, because we also have everybody covered by UTM systems, it's one in 2,500. <clears throat> but basically with the conic projection, once you drive that cone through the ellipsoid and project all the points through it, you cut open and lay it out flat, you'll have the central meridian, that's where it's fit to in the center of the area, that defines your grid north. Geodetic north and grid north coincide along the central meridian. As you move east and west of that, grid norths stay parallel. They're all parallel because it's a Cartesian system, it's a rectangular coordinate system. And geodetic norths all converge back towards the pole. The angle between grid north and geodetic north is called the convergence. It's zero at the uh, central meridian and increases numerically as you move east and west from that central meridian. Under the old NAD 27 system, those, that was also called the mapping angle, okay? But it's just generically referred to as a convergence and uses that uh, gamma for the uh, the symbol uh, at the angle between grid north and mag and true north and geodetic north. If you think about it, it's sort of like de declination. <laughs> it's where is one north with respect to the other north. All right. On a uh, cylindric projection, it's a little bit different, <clears throat> simply because of the way the geodetic norths converge. Uh, they don't converge in nice straight lines, but generally over the area that we fit a projection to, they're all relatively parallel in that, in that context. Uh, but basically, it's the same type of thing. At the center, at the central meridian, grid north and geodetic north coincide, so there's no difference between the two. As you move east and west of that, then you're, you start to get the separation between the two. Grid norths are all parallel. Geodetic norths always point back to the, ge uh, the geodetic north pole. Now, the relationship between the two is that the convergence is positive east of the central meridian, and it's negative west of the central meridian. Okay? Uh, and the relationship in directions is the grid azimuth is equal to the true area, the geodetic azimuth, minus the convergence. Okay. So you can kind of think of it as if, if you know what the central meridian is of your particular zone, you know that if you walk east of that, your geodetic north is going to be to the left of your grid north. If you move to the west of that, your geodetic north is going to be to the east of your uh, of your grid north. So you can either remember the equation with all the signs of crap in it, or just think about it logically. If I'm in my zone here, and I'm over on this side, then I know my geodetic north is going to be this angle to the east of my grid north. Okay? Now, in this case, 
Grid north is the one that's constant no matter where you are. Geodetic north is the one that changes position based on where you are. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Now, where do we get information about convergence and all that kind of stuff? Well, there's a couple of different places. Uh, you can go to the NGS uh, survey mark data sheet. And on there will be in addition to the adjusted position for that particular point in it, the whatever realization it's in. Down below will be somewhere the supported coordinate systems. And for this point here that I've got Point Plateau, just north of where I am here, uh, it's got uh, Wisconsin State Plain South Zone, which is a conic projection, and UTM Zone 15. Now there's there's two zones in here for Wisconsin South, one's in meters and the other's in survey feet, okay? Uh, and and it, it says SFFT because in, in Wisconsin, we have legislation that says that it's a survey foot conversion that we use between meters and feet. Some other states have international foot. Uh, I was playing out with some stuff with Oregon. I was talking with some of the guys in Oregon a couple of weeks back here. And it turns out that they use the international foot conversion between the two. So there it says IFT uh, for their units there. But over on here for that point, it tells you what the convergence is. So this one says nine, zero, minus, uh, minus zero degrees, 19 minutes, 43.9 seconds. That means I'm west of the central meridian and my geodetic north is to the right or to the east of my grid north. Now, you notice that I've also got UTM zone 15, but this is a positive one degree, 42 minutes, 41.9 seconds. It's a totally different convergence. Why? One, it's a different, it's a different projection system, okay? and it's fit differently. Um, one is the state plane is a conic projection. The uh, UTM is a cylindric projection. And secondly, my central meridian for my uh, conic, or my state plane is east of me, whereas for my U UTM, it's west of me. Okay? So I'm on the west side of one zone, on the east side of the other zone, so my, my signs are going to be different, let alone my magnitude, depending on where I am and that type of thing. So now this, this is how to get between geodetic and between a grid. So if I look at that in other, other places, this is if you're, you can get it from a data sheet. If you haven't got a point that's nearby, but you know your approximate latitude and longitude, you can go to NGS's NCAT software online. If you've never used that, that's a that's kind of the catch-all program for everything now. It takes the place of NADCON, VERTCON, and all this kind of stuff. It does conversions, datum to datum conversions, and within conversions. But basically, you can put in a position, and it'll give back to you uh, as part of the information, it'll give you the convergence at that area, okay, scale factor and all that kind of neat stuff. Uh, it does not support, there are coordinate systems that does not support, like in Wisconsin, we use a lot, the, the county coordinate systems, our low distortion systems. Those are not supported by NGS. So you can't go to NGS and run NCAT and get convergencies in, in, you know, for our, our coordinate system. So for that, you have to go to something else. You either have to have software that supports county coordinate systems, and what most of the software does now, or I have a product I put together, whoops, I spelled it wrong here. It's the nat83conversion.xlsm, which is an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and it shows all the direct numbers calculations and stuff for the state plane zones. I also have one developed for the county coordinate systems in Wisconsin. But but there are products like that that will give you uh, the convergence. For instance, this is the printout from mine, Wisconsin South Zone uh, survey feet. I put it in my latitude and longitude. It gives me my conversion factor here, or my convergence. Or if I put in my coordinates, it gives me my convergence down here. So. Again, depending on the software, but there are ways to get it, okay? And generally, it doesn't change a lot over an area. So if, if you're not right on top of a control point, you've got something in the vicinity, uh, you'll have, that'll probably be close enough for the conversions that you need to be doing, if you need to be doing any of that stuff. As an example of applying this type of correction, and this is problem number 7A on the assignment, 
Uh, at Point Platte, though, we said the state plane south zone convergence was negative 0 degrees, 19 minutes, 43.9 seconds. Now, in, in the old days, <clears throat> back, back in the old days, when we, they had Bilby steel towers and crap that you had to crawl up on top of and sight at night and stuff like that, uh, they'd be up there in the middle of the night with uh, telerometers and geometers, early geometers, and uh, T4s and stuff like that, and be measuring angles and distances to points that were 20, 30, 40 kilometers away. So uh, at Lancaster, which is approximately 22.7 kilometers away, they observed an uh, angle to it, and, they, and in the adjustment, this is what the adjusted geodetic azimuth was for that point. So it's three, 303 degrees, uh, 22 minutes, 52.0 seconds. That's a, in a packed format. Uh, point Platteville is located in our little uh, green space in the middle of Point, in the middle of the city of Platteville. And when you stand on it, it's surrounded by tall buildings and trees. It was established in 1935. And you look around you and you look towards Lancaster, you say, how in the hell can they see Lancaster from here? Well, it turns out if you read the, the, the sheet, <laughs> They had a tower that was 90 feet tall, 30 meters tall, that they were occupying on top of that. And at the, at the, uh, at the dome, they had another tower that was uh, 40 meters, I think, high with the light on top of it. So they were sighting long, long distances and stuff. These guys, if you ever get a chance, go to the photo archives on the NGS website. Look at some of these crazy guys crawling around on top of those Bilby Towers and stuff. It's really interesting to see these guys uh, uh, working on top of these things. Anyway, so here we got a geodetic azimuth from uh, Point Platteville to the dome of 303 degrees, 22, 25.2 seconds. Well, the grid azimuth, uh, the geodetic azimuth is the geodetic meridian is to the east of grid because it's negative. So that means this is our geodetic azimuth, our grid azimuth, we're going to add that value to it or subtract the negative value. So it's 303 degrees, 42 minutes, 35.9 seconds to, to get from, from grid to geodetic. Okay. Well, all right, another tort along that same line. Uh, what is uh, if we want to convert, we got a grid azimuth in the south state plane coordinate zone is 135.18.25 in the south zone of the state plane coordinate. And we want to know what's the grid azimuth in the UTM zone 15. Okay. Now, there's a couple of approaches to this. One way is to do it in, in an equation form, strictly equation form, say that we know that. Uh, the grid is equal to GDAC minus the convergence. We can solve that for this, stick it in this equation, put it in there in terms of UTM and solve that and come up with this number here. Da, da, da. Or the way I prefer to do it is I draw sketches. <laughs> okay. So here is my, my situation with my state plane. I know that my geodetic is to the east of my state plane or of my state plane grid north. I can convert that to this angle, I could take that angle because it's off the geodetic north and then use my convergence for UTM to convert that to a UTM uh, grid system. Uh, remember that even though I've got my geodetics pointing in different directions here, that line, that angle is still the same between a geodetic and the line on the ground in both systems. Okay, I'm just drawing my grid up upright. Okay? Easy, easy enough to do, not always easy enough to visualize how that works. Okay. Well, one, couple, one other thing, a couple other things I want to mention here. I want, want to drag this out too long. Um, we This came up uh, earlier in one of the earlier sessions when we were talking, I think when, when Dane uh, was doing his uh, discussions on single double proportionate measurement in the public land survey system, and we were talking about cardinal equivalence. Uh, you got to remember that when you're doing cardinal equivalence, you have to do that in terms of the true meridian, according to what the uh, manual says. If you're working in a grid system, be it state plane or UTM 
or like county coordinate system, you can't just reduce it to cardinal equivalents in that system. You have to convert that system from the grid system to the true system and then do the reductions in that system, uh, the latitudes and departures in that. Now, and, and here's where things get a little, little gushy and stuff, because it, it's supposed to be based on the true meridian and the convergence between grid uh, and convergence of grid is to geodetic. And geodetic and true really aren't the same thing, but the BLM models it up even more by referencing the astronomic meridian and saying it's the same as the true meridian also. So they kind of treat it all as, as one big thing. Well, when you look at the, the accuracy of the original directions that were given, they weren't given to like nearest tenth of a second. They were given to like nearest minute or tenth of a minute or so. So within that, that range of accuracy of the original bearings, it doesn't matter if you're using geodetic grid or, or true. Okay, so we can in fact use the convergence to convert from a grid system to the geodetic system and just call that true and then do everything based on that. But if you don't do that, then you're going to have a rotational issue in there. Okay, if I was working in UTM in that south zone, I'd had over a degree of rotational issue in there. Now, a degree doesn't sound like much, but if you're going a half a mile, the quarter corner that you're reestablishing and a quarter of a, and a half a mile, that one degree rotation is going to make a difference. It's going to make a big difference in that. So you want to be sure that you've got it in the right system to begin with. All right. All right now, this last part is trivia. Okay. If there are some, some of you may have gotten into this kind of stuff before. Some of you older surveyors like me. Uh, I mean, but astronomic is another direction-based system. And we don't use it a lot anymore, but we still have the vestiges of it in the information that we provide on the survey mark data sheets. Uh, in the original traditional control surveys, before we had uh, satellite-based systems, all of our observations were ground-based. And to establish directions, we did celestial observations. Uh, and that meant, and I don't mean like solar observations, because a lot of people have done solar observations. Those weren't accurate enough for doing control surveys. You had to do actual Polaris observations or other star observations, and then do them over a couple of night period, and then reduce all of that data. And I just put up a sampling, and we was talking a little bit about this beforehand, or at least I was talking about it, whether you heard me or not, because my, my audio was turned off. <laughs> uh, some, of the, some of the real historic instruments along these lines, uh, the VIL T4 was designed exclusively for star observations. Uh, and that was, uh, it, weighed, it, weighed, it was only about 439 produced. They weighed over 200 pounds. Uh, and it took two guys to pack this thing into a location. This actually came apart. The, the telescope and the uh, spindle sat on open standards here. And you actually had to take those apart and pack them into wooden crates and haul them into a location. And then you couldn't just put it on a regular tripod because the, the base on it was almost 12 inches across. This thing was huge. Uh, and, and normally you had to let it sit there for a while to settle in. Okay, before because uh, it would it would uh, go out of level and have this tremendously large bubble vial that you put across the standards to, to level it. But it had a 0.1 second circle resolution. 0.1 second resolution. That was a glass circle with an estimation of 0 0.05 seconds. Okay. Uh, and the the short the the shortest focusing distance on it was like 200 meters. You couldn't see anything closer than 200 meters away from it. And that was what's called, referred to as a broken telescope instrument. Uh, because you were doing star observations, your telescope was always at a really high angle. You couldn't just kind of peek underneath there and putting in a set of prisms to, to turn your eye would introduce more distortion. So what you did is you actually looked into the side of the instrument through a prism that went through there. So it was actually a 90 degree bend in there. Uh, the DKM3 was set up like that also. 
Uh, the other workhorse instruments that were uh, used a lot for uh, triangulation networks were the VIL T3, which was a step below this guy here. Uh, I could read directly to two tenths of a second with estimation of one tenth of a second. And the Kern DKM3, which was the equivalent uh, Kern product. Uh, to the T the T three. Well, basically, those are the guys that we used to make ob star observations. Now, how 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 well how many the star observations? We look at the network geometry triangulation. These are the old FGCC eighty four standards that came along before the the latest FGCS standards came along. Astronomic observation spacing not more than you have to do every eight triangles. Okay? And you generally had to view it over two separate nights. You had to have two different nights of separation. Uh, to, and you did it at night because, one, you can't see the stars during the daytime. And secondly, uh, the atmosphere was much more stable at night than it was in the day because you didn't have the sun heating it up. But that means you didn't start observing right away at night. You had to wait for the atmosphere to stabilize. So it took a while to get set up on this. Now, you think it's hard seeing crosshairs during the daytime. Try seeing your crosshairs at mm -hmm. night when you're staring at the star. And, and you know what? When you zoom in on Polaris, even with a 40, 40 power scope, you know how much bigger Polaris looks? It doesn't. <laughs> exactly. It's <laughs> for all intents and purposes, it's at infinity. You know what I mean? So it doesn't, it, I mean, it, don't, it doesn't have like a five little points on it and stuff like that. It, it just, It's just a pinpoint of light that uh, when you're trying to find it and you look up and you can point that and say, well, there's a pointer uh, uh, stars from the Big Dipper and all like that. There it is right there. And you look through the telescope and instead of seeing one star, you see a thousand of them. <laughs> you know, then you got to try to figure out which one's Polaris and stuff. It does not, it's not labeled. Uh, but anyway, so basically, when you look at what astronomic north is, and again, this is, I, I dug around looking at some definitions I could pull out just use and say, oh, there is there. Astronaut, the geodetic logic says the positive direction of a line tangent to the gravity equipotential surface at the observer. Ta-da! Got that? <laughs> what that basically means is that when you're setting up the instrument to observe on Polaris, you're referencing yourself with respect to the geoid, not the ellipsoid, not the rotational axis of the Earth, you're orienting yourself with respect to the geoid. The geoid is an equal potential surface. So that if you have a local anomaly, and a good example of this is those of you that live towards the Rocky Mountains and that type of stuff, right in, in the foothills, as you're getting close to the Rocky Mountains and stuff, the, the direction of gravity actually deflects towards the mountains because the mountains are a giant mass anomaly. And gravity is a function of mass. So anytime you have anomalies, that affects the direction of gravity. Well, it affects the direction of gravity, it affects your instrument setup. So when you set up the instrument and you start sighting on Polaris to establish the direction, you reference with respect to whatever the geoid looks like in that particular area. So what that means is gravity has an influence on the astronomic meridian. And because there are undulations in the geoid, that means astronomic north meridians aren't nice and smooth. Now, they do converge to an astronomic north, but they're not smooth in that context. Okay? So that's different than geodetic north. It's different than magnetic north. It's different than uh, grid north. And when push comes to shove, if you ever done, has anybody ever done a Polaris observation? All right, I got George got, I used to always make, this is 30 years ago, I would make the students go out and we'd always do at least one night's worth of Polaris observations on a control survey. I got another one, Chandra's got his thumbs up on it, just so they could experience and see what's involved in the process. But you find out that there is no pole star per se. Polaris, if you were to track it over 24 year, 24 hour period, uh, ascribes an ellipse, an elliptical orbit around the pole. It's about four minutes wide, and the pole is in the middle of that. So basically, 
And this is it. For again, those of you who have done this, remember the old PZS triangle and stuff. You have what was called the celestial sphere. And when you were sighting on the star, you measured the horizontal and vertical angles, and you also measured the time right away. And we used to have our little shortwave radio out there tuned to the uh, National, the Naval Observatory, and they did the time, the time tech on there all the time. So then you would know what time you when you when you put your crossers on the star when it crossed your your uh, uh, crossers, you took the time at that point because time told you where that star was once you had the ephemeris. So you dug that up, then you took your position and you could figure out from all that kind of stuff where astronomic north was with respect. There was a lot of calculations involved in the process. But it was really an interesting interesting prod uh, way to do that. So the, the PZS triangle is in reference to the pole, the zenith with reference to the operator, and S, which is the star, the PZS triangle, and, and solving that thing. And that thing changes over time. All the pole and the zenith is, is stays in the same place. The star changes position as you go as you go over time. Good. So we did uh, Nevada last summer. We did. It. In 22, we did a uh, Polaris observation yeah. as part of our uh, YSN young uh, young surveyor activity. So we had a good time. Yeah, that, 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 that's a that's a wonderful exercise to do. Mm -hmm. uh, just got to be careful if you don't have the right kind of lighting system on the instrument, because most, on the older instruments you had a, a, a lighting system you could put on in place of the mirrors, and on top of the scope was a little a uh, little knob that you turned. And that rotated a little mirror inside it. It would just just bounce enough of the light back, back to illuminate your crosshairs. Uh, if you didn't have that, then what you'd have, you'd have somebody standing in front of you with a flashlight showing it in through the side. And if they really didn't like you, just as you're about to take the reading, they'd shine it right straight through the <laughs> scope and blind you. Your, your night blindness would be gone for good. We did the flashlight. Yeah, yeah. So you, you can do it. You got to be careful with respect to that. Yeah. But uh, uh, and, and you can do a solar a solar observation is similar except because the sun is so much closer, uh, it's harder to point at and get as accurate a position. Plus, uh, you have to worry about uh, parallax effect. The fact that you're not at the center of the Earth but you're on the surface of the Earth with Polaris, that's not an issue because it's so far away. There's all sorts of neat stuff. I wish we taught that kind of stuff. Anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, so astronomic marines converge. Now, so what we have when we're doing this, we're trying to reference ourselves with respect to something else, whether it's geodetic or grid, which is based on geodetic. We have to be able to relate our astronomic observation to that. And a part of the, the fit of the ellipsoid to the geoid, we've got that separation of geoid height. Uh, under NAD 27, we assumed they both coincided everywhere so that there, there was no separation between the two surfaces. But for all intents and purposes now, because we've got a global fit, there's a separation between those two surfaces. There are about 30 meters across the United States, negative 30 meters. But there's also another parameter that we don't talk too much about, and that's how skewed the surfaces are with respect to each other. They're not parallel because the, the ellipsoid is a nice smooth surface. But the, the geoid isn't. So at any given point, when we orient ourselves with our bubbles, we're orienting ourselves with respect to the geoid. That's what we're doing when we're doing a solar, a, a Polaris observation. But when we want a reference to the ellipsoid, we got a lip, we've got to reference ourselves to that normal to the ellipsoid, that, that right angle intersection. Well, the angle between those two is what's called the deflection of the vertical. If the deflection of the vertical is zero, that means the two surfaces are parallel to each other. If there's a, an angle between them, that means there's a separation. Well, that skewness is a correction that's applied that's called the Laplace correction. And to convert astronomic to geodetic, we have to go through this guy right here, which is the Laplace correction, which is a function of the launch, the astronomic launch, too, as well as the geodetic launch, should and the astronomic uh, or the geodetic latitude of the point. Man, this is getting more complicated the further we get into it. Thankfully, we model all that 
in NGS. And on the data sheet, you'll see a line on there. It says Laplace correction. And that's the difference between geodetic and astronomic north at a point. So there's another meridian conversion. So if I do an astronomic observation and I want to get that into a grid system, I would take and I would apply my Laplace correction to my astronomic observation to get a geodetic one out of it, then apply my convergence to get into my state, into my uh, grid system. So that's just another one. Now, it's not very big, okay? and it varies depending on where you are in that type of thing, but you can model it. You can go to the NGS. They've got a program called Deflect 18. That's based on their, 19, their 2018 model of the geoid. So every time they come up with an updated geoid model, they'll update their deflect model. And you can go under it, it'll, it'll give you the, the correction in seconds. Uh, and that, that's what the Laplace correction is. So a little bit of surveying trivia there. So you can always uh, wow your folks at, uh, your wow, wow friends at parties and stuff, say, hey, I'm going to tell you about when I applied the Laplace correction. <clears throat> so, <laughs> all right. Will you ever use it? Probably not. Like I say, use it to impress your friends. Okay, another bit of surveying trivia. It's one of those things that, that kind of is a neat from a real historical con context, uh, but not very really practical in application anymore. I, I, I had an instructor when I was in college and graduate school that said, every time he tried to emphasize something in class, he said, look, if I ever meet you in a bar 10 years from now, sitting on a bar stool, and I ask you, the one thing I want you to remember from this class is, and he, he'd tell you where it was. And he gave us so many of those that there's no way in hell I was going to remember any of that stuff. So I'm glad I never ran into him in a bar. <laughs> anyway, um, so, all right, let's, uh, there's one, pro that I, I worked through most of those problems that were on there. Their answers are in here. Uh, the only one I haven't covered so far is the very first question, which was on there. And that was, what are the differences between true geodetic magnetic grid and astronomic north? So anybody want to tell me? Uh, we'll do this line by line. How are they defined? Do they converge? Are they uniform? And are they constant over time? Who wants to go with true? How is it defined? It's a line from the North Pole and the South Pole as defined by the rotation of the Earth. Right, yeah, pass it to the observer's location. Do they converge? Do the meridians converge? No. Yeah. No, only at the North Pole and the South Pole, right? Yeah, well, they converge. Ultimately, yeah. as you trace them up, they all converge, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, are, are they uniform? Yeah. Pretty much smooth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're smooth. And are they constant over time? Yes. Yep. They never change. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So I got rotation. Okay. How about geodetic? What's that define? How's that defined? Someone else. Someone else. Throwing twenty answers here. Geodetic. Mm -hmm. right. The ellipsoid. Ellipsoid. Right. Yeah. So it's going to be based on the ellipsoid geometry, and the poles are defined by what? Semi-minor axes, right? The semi-minor axes, that coincides with their rotation, okay? Uh, or do they converge? Do the meridians converge? Yeah. Yes, they do. Are they uniform? Smooth? Yeah. Yes, yes. It's a mathematical surface, so they're all, they're all uniform. And are they constant over time? Could be, yes. Yeah, yeah, because it's the ellipsoid. It's a GRSA ellipsoid. Even if we move the ellipsoid around, okay, as long as it's the same ellipsoid, it's the same geodetic. Uh-oh. Yeah. We lost Jerry. It's like pulling teeth. Oh. I should have been a dentist. I would have made more money. <laughs> you, you blacked out on this there for a second. You froze. <laughs> oh. Am I, am I here? You, you you're, you're good to go now. <laughs> now we're on magnetic. Well, yeah, now, now we're on magnetic. Someone in a bar yet? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I've already left for the bar. Um, <laughs> magnetic. How are they define? What, what are they based on? Magnetic. magnetic field. Magnetic field of the Earth, right? Uh, do they converge? Yes. Yeah, for the most part, they do. 
Are they uniform? No. No, they go all over the place, right? And are they constant over time? No. No. Can I tell a quick story about that? Sure. I worked with a young lady who was licensed as a land surveyor. She was also a Marine. Trent probably knows who I'm talking about. She was uh, stationed at, as part of her Marine Corps service. She was stationed at the South Pole. One of the things that they had as a mission each year was to set a monument to the South Pole. Uh -huh. She had a photograph that showed about eight monuments in kind of a spiral that was the position of the of the South Pole over several years. Amazing. I wish I had a copy of that photo. It, it, it was just amazing. Yeah, well, that's that goes back to the uh, the fact that the Earth wobbles on its axis yep. and stuff. So it's a question of uh, at any given time, what's what's the rotational axis? Yeah. So that's why there, there's a oh crap, I can't forget, I can't remember the name of the international organization, the International Geophysical Union or whatever, something like that, that actually has a definition for it based on the observation over time period, sort of like a. Uh, you know, mean sea level defined by 19 year observation period, same type of thing for the North Pole location. Well, that, but, but again, if, if surveyors are involved, it's no surprise that they all come up with different locations for the same point. So, so we have a monuments nest at the South Pole is what you're telling me. Yeah, that, that was the mission was to monument the position of the South Pole yeah. once a year. Yeah. And I, I'm assuming it was done relatively close to the same time each year. I don't yeah. know. I should have been smart enough to ask, but I wish I'd have been smart enough to ask for a copy of the photo because <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. There's, this, there's this snowy background. They're setting this thing in, in a, like a, a glacier. Uh huh. And there's, there's all these little monuments in kind of a <laughs> semicircle. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. That would be cool. If you ever track that down, let us know. I will do so. Okay. All right. Grid. How are those defined? Grid north. Based on what? It's a projection of your system that you're using and how it's fit to the ellipsoid, right? Uh, is it, do they converge? Do grid norths converge? Yes. Yeah. Do grid norths converge? Oh, oh. no, yeah. they're got, got, on the grid. They're the parallel. Grid norths do not. Remember, it's yeah, a grid yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Parallel, okay. <laughs> uh, are they uniform? Yes. 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 And are they constant over time? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, because they're, yeah. they're, they're a static system that are fit to the ellipsoid. So that's uh, projection central meridian. Converge, no, uniform, yes, constant, yes. And how about astronomic? How's that defined? Polaris. Yeah, Polaris is basically a gravity-based system. It's, it's reference to the ellipsoid, or the uh, geoid. Uh, do the meridians converge? Yes. Yes, they, they do. Are they uniform in their convergence? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, because remember, it's referenced to... Oh, you're, we're talking, yeah. The, you know, the, the, geoid, the geoid undulates and stuff. Yeah. So okay, uh, it's really the only time I ever used that word undulate is when I'm talking about the geoid. Nothing mm -hmm. ever out there uh, undulates. You always look for a, an opportunity to slip in a word like nocturnal is another one that I like. And then corporeal hereditaments, but that doesn't come up in conversations very often. Uh, Conversion, no, uniform, no. Are they constant over time? No. No, because the geoid changes over time because that's based on mass anomalies of the Earth shifting and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yes, no, no, gravity-based, okay. And that is it. I burned through stuff real quick there. Not a lot of material. Uh, there's my compass going nuts on us here. <laughs> so, are there any questions on that? Um that was, that was great. Yeah, no, it was great. Uh, the one question where you were talking about the the T four, do you know the production years? Like, when did they make that thing? Uh it was in the in the thirties and the forties, I believe it was. Okay. okay. Um, 
it, it, it's interesting the, the history behind that because Vild, the guy that started the company that built it, he he was a, he loved working with optics and machinists that type of thing. But as his company got more popular, and that they started pushing him up more and more into administration. So he finally said, "The hell with this," and he left and he went to work for another company called Kern. And you notice that Kern and Vild Instruments were the same color. That wasn't an accident. That's because Vild used to work for Kern and design their instruments for him. That's why there was a one-to-one -one comparison. There was a DKM3 and a T3, a D DKM2 and a T2, a DKM1 and a T1. So they ran parallel. Lots of surveying trivia. All right. Um, I can, I, I'll, I'll dig us more information on T4 for you if you're interested in, and send that to you. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. I threw a few things in the chat as well while we were going along. I threw in um, the Bilby Steel Towers. There was something in Indiana history as well that talks yeah. about those towers as well. So, yeah, they just did a, a, a some sort of a celebration of those because they originated in back in Indiana. They did something on it a couple of years back. Uh, I don't think they let people climb them, but. Yeah. Actually, concentric towers. It was an inner tower that was for the instrument, and then there was an outer tower for the operator. So as you moved around, you weren't disturbing the, the instrument setup. You yeah. think setting up over a point where the plumb bob is exactly. five feet above the ground, try 100 feet above the ground. Exactly. <laughs> Mount Diablo has a, a pretty neat base station. If you ever get a chance to go there, it's uh -huh. really interesting. Very cool. Um, was that uh, who was the surveyor, George? Was it Barbara Lattell or no? Yeah, it was Barbara. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Steve had put in the chat. So, yep. Okay. Okay. I don't Very see cool. That. Okay, I don't have my chat window. Were there any questions in the chat window? No, no, you were good. Yeah, it was just right, a bunch okay. of links. And then uh, uh, Steve had, had one when we were kind of going back and forth, but it was 10 minutes ago about uh, um, constant over time, question mark. Yeah, well, again, constant versus, I mean, when we talk about constant, we're talking about relatively stable over time, but again, within accuracy limits. Uh, that's sort of like true north because, like you said, the earth wobbles and true north actually does change over time. But for all intents and purposes, the way we apply it and use it, we consider it pretty much stable over time. Mm. Uh, Brad was looking for a link to basic Lambert uh, instructions and finding grid factors, etc. Go to jerrymalhoon.com. There you go. I'll, I think I threw that. I threw. Um, I threw your spreadsheets in there too, under your software, but yeah, you got that link up there, uh, Brad, up there a little yeah. bit higher, or I can throw it in there again, but <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And if you have any other questions, feel free to follow up on any of that stuff. I'm, I'm, I, I'm retired. I got nothing but time on my hands. <laughs> There's the link just to uh, the main page of his uh, site. Brad. Mm -hmm. That's that retirement is tough, Jerry. I'm, I'm struggling with mine too. I find I've I've got way too much screen time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I just updated my LinkedIn profile. I didn't realize it sent that out to everybody that was on my list. <laughs> so I sent on. I've been getting comments back, and one came, came from a student says, "Congratulations on your third retirement. I'm still working on a homework assignment of yours from 16 years ago." <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'm, I'm amazed at how many job offers you get, even though you say you're retired. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, getting those all the time. Let me stop sharing. <laughs> I'm getting those all the time, and I'm not asking for them. No. I'm getting hints on how I can make myself more attractive to be hired. I don't want to be hired. <laughs> I, I love my new boss. <laughs> He's really good to me. <laughs> 50 plus years, right? Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. Very cool. That was great. I uh, very informative. So fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, next one's a Polaris observation for you. We can do that over Zoom. That'll be interesting. <laughs> we can maybe simulate it. 
<laughs> I do have. Give me some time to think. I do have my collection of stuff. Right, I do have a T three that I bought. I haven't fired up yet for outside, so it's a it's a pretty beat up one. But I do have a T two, and I have the battery packs and the lighting kits for it. Mm -hmm. I have illuminated the targets for at night. And I, as a matter of fact, I also have a USGS uh, target light for sighting long distances. So we can set up a 20 kilometer baseline and we can, we can fire that guy off and do a Polaris observation on that. I'm all up for it. Summer camp in West, in Platteville. I love it. We should maybe <laughs> consider doing a, a, a solar to compare the two, uh, just for the hell of it. I've got a roll off for my T1. Oh, did, you ever do it where, did you ever do it where you project it through onto a, a white sheet of paper? Yeah, I've tried that. That's that's not that's fun not. either. Yeah, uh, it, it, so it, it, it works. It works, and I've actually shown students eclipses. We, we yeah, I was going to say, that's how we did it. Yeah. Like that. yeah, Show the eclipse on the back the side oh, of the newspaper. It's, you That's just funny. gotta think back asswards when you're doing that. So you gotta know which way you're turning in slow motions to catch up with the sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the sun's a little harder to get in front of and stay on too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, try try Polaris at upper or lower culmination when it's moving like crazy horizontally. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, okay. Anybody, That's Anybody got any more questions? If you have any more questions, or you need to contact me afterwards. You got my contact information there. Yep. Um, well, more than welcome to ask me. I threw all that in there. Uh, we're off until January 8th. And then Jerry actually comes back uh, February 5th for spiral curves. So You betcha. <laughs> Four hour break time down every time I have to relearn how to do those. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's perfect. So. Awesome, everybody. Uh, Wednesday, chapter five of Wisdom of Wednesdays is this week as well. And then uh, we'll be off on uh, Christmas break for that one as well. So I love it. Right. Awesome, Merry guys. Christmas, everyone. Happy, happy Merry Christmas. Christmas. Have a good, good weekend, night. everybody. Bye, Bye, guys. Happy holidays. See you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry.